very warm welcome to the Uxbridge FM History Show and once again a warm welcome to Ken Pierce, Chairman of the Uxbridge Local History Society. Hi Ken, how are you? Oh, very well, thank you. Good morning all. <laughs> and today is a third talk in our series of Emily's Diary. Yes, thank you. Um, I've been talking previously about Emily Fern and the diary she kept in her home in Windsor Street in 1853. Uh, in my final visit to the diary, I want to read you some actual entries from her book and, um, uh, if necessary, comment on them. So, we begin on January the 25th, 1853. She writes, We found ourselves in the little village of Cowley and its primitive little church, hallowed by me from its containing the relics of my dear father and several other relations. Finding the key in the door, we walked in. At eight o'clock, we went to the lecture at the public rooms given by Mr. Hunt about chemistry, explaining gases and the art of making them. That noisy Mr. Harmon sat next to me, returned home at half past nine. It's interesting to notice that there are apparently a series of public lectures at that time. Remember that um, education at this period was not compulsory. It took another almost 20 years before that came about. And many people were beginning to find themselves ignorant about many matters. And many found that by educating themselves, they could progress further in life and improve their lot. So the talk about chemistry uh, was one of our whole series that was being given at the time. Back to the diary, January 26th, remained at home all morning, engaged in domestic duties, made mince pies, bread, and a variety of sweetmeats. Now, Emily was 20, but on February the 11th, she writes, swept my room, and thoroughly set it to, to rights, for it is my long-talked-of grand clearing-up day. Tomorrow I attain to woman's estate, and will no longer be a child. I shall cut off a lock of my hair, and preserve it as a remembrance of my twenty-first birthday eve. Mama and Sis walked up to Hillingdon to visit Grandpa. Mr. K remained indoors all evening, improving a windmill he was making. Commence lessons with little Annie today, and find I improve very much in phonography. Uh, phonography is what we would call shorthand. Some of Emily's diary is actually written in shorthand. The reason was, although it could be locked, her stepfather, Mr. K, kept picking the lock to find out what she was writing. <laughs> so her answer was to write in shorthand so that he wouldn't be able to read it. Uh, most uh, of the, of the um, writing about in shorthand was was about a, a boy, local boyfriends. Um, I've shown. Um, people this um, section in shorthand uh, and they think it's an early version of Pittman's. Anyway, now let's get on to the birthday itself. February the 12th. I am 21 and capable of making a will, but they tell me that I've always had one of my own. Another day of snow. Went and posted aunt's letter. Now, can I just pause and comment on that? She had to go to the post office because at this particular time, letterboxes had not yet appeared on the streets of this country. 
they were about to. The post office had realized it would be a good idea. And one of the people very much involved was the novelist Anthony Trollope, who worked for the uh, uh, post office at the time. So although Emily had to go to the post office to post a letter, it wasn't long before these letter boxes began to appear in the streets. And incidentally, if you want to see an early example, there's one in Eaton High Street, which has a vertical slot to put the letters in and not a horizontal one. Back to the birthday. Met Mr. Shoppy. He wished me many happy returns of the day. Came home. Mama kissed me and scolded me in the same breath. One for my birthday and the other for not getting the bread and butter cut. I do not find I am the least re respected any more than before. Finished making a plaid frock for Johnny. Mr. K bought me a coconut for my birthday. After tea, Sis and I walked up to Grandpa in Hillingdon. I fell down in the snow. February the 14th, Valentine's Day. Took little Annie to Johnson's the Drapers for a new beaver bonnet. Met Mr. Harmon, so he was my Valentine. But apparently the, the first person you met on that particular day was supposed to be your Valentine. I told him I was going to call him Frog because he was so active. The afternoon's post, yeah, afternoon's post, two deliveries a day. The afternoon's post brought me a detestable Valentine for which I had to pay tuppence telling me that I was after every Joe and Jack in the neighbourhood. That's John Redford's spite. So I cut it up in small pieces, put it in an envelope, and Mama took it with her to post in London and make him pay tuppence for it. He'd obviously sent this, or somebody had sent it, without a stamp, you see. And uh, in, in those days, if... There was no stamp on the letter. You had to pay double tuppence. <laughs> anyway, um, the diary goes on to explain later that uh, she was wrong. It had not been sent by young Mr. Redford, but by somebody else. February the 17th, Grandpa's birthday. He's 71 today. Harriet Lovell ran up into my bedroom this morning before I was up, mad with toothache, and she wished me to put a leech on it for her. I promised to do so after breakfast. I arranged dinner and then went round to Miss Lovell's. I think in those days that leeches were kept in tanks in the chemist shops and you could uh, go and hire one as it were <laughs> whether you would fancy a leech put in your mouth to suck the blood <laughs> i don't know but it uh, w was the case at the time i'm not sure that leeches used in medical um, you you have completely disappeared i think they may be used occasionally. We went up to tea, after tea, to Hillingdon to see Grandpa, but I grew tired and came home on my own at half past ten. How quiet the high street seemed. Not one person around. I listened at Mr. Wills's window and heard him and Mr. Willis laughing as they played at cards. Then, crossing over, I remained for a moment at Mrs. Fastnage's to hear the merry hum of children's voices. They're having a party tonight, and I could hear them romping heartily. And then, when I reached the new inn in Windsor Street, 
a violin was playing merrily, and I could hear heavy sounds as of people dancing. But a few houses lower down, a solitary light was burning in a window. Poor Mrs. Gannon breathed her last yesterday, leaving a daughter and two sons to mourn her loss. What a contrast, revelry and mourning. March the 24th, Maundy Thursday, Market Day and Lady Day, the fair was kept also. I went over to Mrs. Dix's before breakfast with two ounces of tea and some butter, sugar and coffee to the value of a shilling. Poor old creature, how pleased she was. Uh, Mrs. Dix was an elderly widow uh, who lived across the road from Emily. Next day, March the 25th, Good Friday. I went to church in the morning alone. We had salt fish for dinner because it was a fast day. April the 4th, a bright sunny morning, went down into the fields near Rockingham Bridge to hear the frogs croak. Uh, people seem to have given that up today. Incidentally, Emily went down into the basement of their home one day and found a toad there. April the 5th, cut my thumb very severely with Mr. K's penknife. Hand very stiff, could not hold my dress out of the mud. So they, they had ankle length skirts in those days, which they normally lifted up over um, muddy ground. Still April the 5th. Disturbed in the night by a mouse in the trap in my bedroom and a strange cat dragging the trap across the room. I procured a light, drowned the mouse and hunted the cat out of the house. May the 16th. Sis and I walked to Ickenham after tea and called on our aunt, who asked me to sing for her. So I sang Lords of Creation and Shells of Cusa. How pleased they were. But what a primitive, unsophisticated race they all are at Ickenham. <laughs> I think Steve lives here, you can have done you. <laughs> May the 27th. Ma struck me today, put me in a terrible passion for a short time. She raised some old devilish feelings that I imagined had fled years ago, but I deserved it, for I said, after being reminded of transgressions innumerable, damn everything. May the 28th, Mr. K would not give me any pocket money today because I flicked tea at him out of a spoon. There's a 21-year-old getting pocket money. <laughs> and finally, from June the 1st, she talks about a peddler. A man in the street amused me very much. He went up in the morning bowling, bawling about a new law at halfpenny a copy, and then he came back in the evening with a little book of songs, halfpenny a book. <clears throat> then up again an hour later with the history of a clandestine correspondence between a young lady of Uxbridge and a gentleman of Hillingdon, a halfpenny a copy. Well, there we are. There's. Uh, a few extracts from Emily's diary to bring the story to a close. I'm sure you can see that uh, it gives a wonderful glimpse of everyday life in Uxbridge 160 years ago. Well, thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. I quite agree with her uh, comment about primitive race in Ickenham, yes. 
<laughs> unsophisticated. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you very much for those. That's um, quite an education. We'll pop down to Rockingham exactly. Bridge, I think, and listen to the frogs later on. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> right, more coming up.